Thank you, Giancarlo. What a hero he is uh, to so many in our movement, to so many students from all over the world, in Latin America in particular. I know that uh, our speaker this evening, who succeeded uh, Giancarlo as president of Universidad Francisco Marroquin, will uh, transmit our congratulations and deep affections and best wishes uh, to Giancarlo. He is truly uh, a remarkable and courageous man. Before introducing our speaker this evening, I uh, want to recognize a number of people, and I'm very happy that uh, uh, Universidad Francisco Marroquin, one of our sponsors, is uh, well represented here, not only by the speaker I'll introduce in a moment, its president, but also by uh, Musso Ayal's family. Musso was the founder and Giancarlo's prede predecessor as president of UFM. Uh, Olga, Manuel, Isabel, are you here? Wonderful, thank you. Also, I want to recognize two folks who came the greatest distance to be here with us, literally from halfway around the world. And that would be Ron and Jenny Manners, all the way from Perth, Australia. They have been troopers for freedom and the land down under for many decades. And Ron in particular, I know you go way back. You knew Leonard Reed very well and you've been uh, uh, a, a tremendous advocate for liberty. And Ron even formed his own foundation in Perth to help spread these ideas. You can visit their website at mancal, M-A-N-N-K-A-L dot org and see much about the great uh, work that they do, very similar to what we do at FEE, uh, but uh, tailored to an Australian audience. And also, uh, two dear friends who are not from all that far away, but boy, they have been involved uh, with FEE and free market causes for a long time. I'm speaking of Bill and Retta Lowndes from South Carolina. Bill and Retta, where are you? Oh, okay. Yes, they're there. Thank you. I know you go way back, Bill, because I learned last night of a little bit about your story I didn't know before. Uh, going back, what, 50-some years, more than 50 years, in uh, ideas of liberty and of fee. We deeply appreciate that. Well, I, I'm honored this evening to introduce to you our distinguished uh, keynote speaker, a very good friend of liberty who's been involved with this movement uh, for uh, quite a while, even though he's still a very young guy. Gabriel Calzada is, yeah, let's give him a moment. <laughs> I'm gonna ask you to do that again when I'm done with this uh, introduction. <laughs> His name is Gabriel Calzada, and he's president of Universidad Francisco Marroquin in Guatemala. He is originally from Spain, where he is a well-regarded academic and public policy expert. He is the founding president of one of Europe's most influential think tanks, the Juan de Mariana Institute. Gabriel's research on the economic impact of green jobs in Spain prompted a reversal in that country's policy of green job subsidies. In Washington, Gabriel spoke and testified several times before both houses of Congress on this issue. He's widely published in both Spanish and English. His papers have appeared in Land Use Policy, Economic Affairs, European Planning Studies, the Journal of Libertarian Studies, and several Spanish language journals. He has published more than 500 economic-related op-eds in Spanish newspapers, the Washington Times, all over the place. He's a frequent guest on television and radio. He also founded OMMA, an online graduate school that offers master's programs based on value investing and the Austrian business cycle. AMA is the acronym for Online de Madrid Manuel Ayal. Gabriel has a PhD in economics from Universidad Rey Juan Carlos in Madrid. He's an adjunct scholar at the Ludwig von Mises Institute and a board member 
of the Association of Private Enterprise Education and the Mont Pelerin Society. He was a fellow at the Center for New Europe in Brussels, an intern at the Acton Institute, and a Rowley Fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute. Will you welcome, please, Dr. Gabriel Calzada. Thank you, Larry. Well, you know, I went to the U.S. Congress and the U.S. Senate, but I don't think it was very successful there. But now that I'm on Jeffrey Tucker's team, I, I think we will get the message out. Giancarlo asked me to, to tell you that, uh, beg you pardon for talking like Donald Duck. And this is very unjust because speaking like Donald Duck is the only thing that I can do better than Giancarlo. I'm Donald Duck. It's the only thing. And, but he says that his English is, has not aged too well, at least not as well as his bottles of wine from Spain. Okay. So the, the title of uh, my talk tonight is uh, Why Would We Invest? Why Should We Invest? in the freedom's next generation? Uh, this is a very important question, a uh, very sensible question. And um, there, are, there is one of, one of my big heroes, uh, I'm a Marxist also, like Larry, uh, has a sentence, has a saying that says, uh, why should I care about posterity? What has posterity ever done for me? This was Marx, Groucho Marx, <laughs> and uh, what I'm trying to, do tonight is to explain why you should care about posterity. And I'm going to give you an example that uh, is very related to, to fee and, uh, and to UFM. Uh, let, me, let me begin in order to give you this example with uh, this man, with Benjamin Rogge. In 1971, at a feast, on, on, on um, the occasion of FIS 25th anniversary, Benjamin Rogge gave a, a speech uh, titled Fi, Success or Failure. So Benjamin Rogge tried to, to see if these 25 first years could be seen as a, a success or whether they were a failure. And he said that in, it depended on what you mean with success and what you mean with failure. And he chose four different meanings for success. He says, in three of them, we cannot say that fee has been successful, but only in one of them, fee has been successful, had been successful. And he says, it is uh, in, in one sense, uh, and you have to take the interpretation of the phrase su successful or successful in its mission, that Leonard Reed's, or Leonard Reed's own definition uh, of how uh, the success of fee had to be measured. And uh, I'm quoting, he said, to measure a teacher, he, he's speaking about learner's risk measurement, to, teach, uh, to measure a teacher's success, to evaluate his work, one must ask, does the teaching include in others what Aristotle termed activity of soul? It is to this question, uh, Rogge continued, that the final and unqualified and only significant yes can be given. Throughout this country, throughout the world, there is activity of the soul underway that would never have been undertaken but for the work and the inspiration of Leonard Reed and the Foundation for Economic Education. Some of it, all of us in this room know about and can identify with fee. Some of it is known to only one or two of those in this room, the greater part. Sorry, the greater part, and probably the most important part, is totally unknown and yet to any, as yet to any of us, including Leonard Reed, and will come to light only in the decades and centuries ahead. And much of it will be done by people who will never have heard of the foundation and will have no awareness that the activity of soul in which they are involved is 
the last link in, the long in a long chain that goes back to something that was started by the foundation in the middle of the 20th century." End quote. So, what I'm, I'm going to relate my presentation to this uh, quote by, by Benjamin Rogge. And uh, uh, specifically, I want to tell you a story about the impact of the Freeman. I know there are hundreds of stories, thousands of stories, probably dozens of thousands of stories. Uh, but this is a, a story that I, I know well. In order to, 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 to understand this story, you have to rewind and go back to the 50s. So set your mind in the 50s, and, but not in the 50s in the US, the 50s in, in, in Central America, in Guatemala. And there, at that point, at the late, in the late 50s, you had a group of entrepreneurs, a, a, a group of young, very young entrepreneurs led by Manuela Yao that were trying to discover or to discuss the causes of poverty of Central America and that country. And uh, they had meetings, they had discussions, like the discussions we have uh, continuously about uh, interventionism and the crisis. And um, they really wanted to understand why Guatemala was poor despite of the fact that there, is, there are a lot of uh, natural resources, a lot of brilliant people, very, uh, uh, very close to the US, the biggest market, economic market in the world. But uh, they, they continued this discussion until one day, one of the friends, one of the young entrepreneurs went to Mexico. He traveled for business to Mexico. And well, I'm talking about the kind of travel that you had those days, back in the 50s, before regulators started messing up with, with, with air travel. And uh, this friend of Manuela Yao went to Mexico, and there he met this other entrepreneur who, uh, after dealing with him, gave him, uh, gave him a copy of the Freeman. And his friend went back to, to, to Guatemala with a, with a couple of copies of, of the Freeman of uh, 59 and uh, share the copy with, with the gang. And they start discussing the articles. They, they became very, very excited about, about the ideas. They found uh, the, the kind of answer that they were looking for. A few months later, a couple of months later, Bettina Bean sent a letter to Manuela Yao saying that uh, uh, they were told that they were interested in, in the Freeman and the ideas of fee. So they got a subscription to the, to, to, to the Freeman, and they would receive every month the, the issue of, of the Freeman. And at the end, she says, maybe you can read it, I don't know, it's very, it's very small, that she hoped that those ideas uh, and those texts could be useful for what he was trying to do in Guatemala. Well, while the letter was traveling, the day after you saw that the letter was from the 17th of uh, November, right? Uh, so the next day, while the letter was traveling, exactly the next day, uh, Manuela Yao and his friends were creating the first think tank in Latin America, the CES, the Centro de Estudios Económicos y Sociales. So the letter was traveling to Guatemala, Manuela Yao and the rest of the gang were creating CES. And uh, so remember, this was a group of entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs. They created a think tank. They had to start writing something. And they were not experts in writing. They, they became experts later. But they were not experts in writing uh, texts for the public. So what could they do? Voila, they took the Freeman. They had discussions about the Freeman. And then tra they translated the articles that they thought were the most suitable for the, for the uh, Central American public. So this is, was, this is the, the way the topicos de actualidad uh, became a reality. So the group started discussing the articles and translating some of the, of, of the best uh, articles. This, this one is uh, the capital is in the eyes of the observer. And, uh, and this, this, uh, this pamphlet, Topicos de Actualidad, was distributed, uh, had a, uh, the issues were about 11,000 
numbers, copies, I think. So imagine a country like Guatemala, 11,000 copies of this distributed in the country. This made a huge impact in, in Guatemala. And not only Guatemala, in Spain, when I started uh, studying about Austrian economics, one of the things that the senior uh, professors and libertarians would give me, classical libertarians would give me, was old pamphlets, old pamphlets, uh, almost dark of, of uh, topicos de actualidad. Uh, both Manuela Yao and the man who is in the middle uh, without the gun and um, um, Ulises Dent, thank you, Cayo, <laughs> and Ulises Dent become very close friends of, of uh, Leonard Reed. Uh, after a few months, they came uh, to a seminar, they, they came to, to Fee, and, uh, and they met Leonard. They became, as I said, close friends, especially uh, Ulises then. Uh, Manuel Yao tells in his memory that Ulises and, and, and Leonard became very, very close friends, and that they felt like at home. The very first day they arrived at Fee, they felt like they, they were at home. And so they also met uh, uh, Henry Hazlitt. Uh, they became also a good friend of Henry Hazlitt, and uh, a few uh, years later, it would be Henry Hazlitt and Dean Russell, the ones who would introduce Manuela Yao and Olga to the Montpellier Society. In fact, this was a letter by Dean Russell and Henry Hazlitt uh, asking for an invitation for the Montpellier Society meeting. Uh, so th this, this group start, started thinking, what can we do apart from translating fee articles? What, what else can we do? Uh, firstly, they thought about uh, 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 creating a newspaper, but Manuela Yao said, no, no, this is not going to work. If we want to disseminate the ideas, the newspaper is not going to work. Who is going to write? We are not experts in writing. And um, his friends uh, said, uh, a couple of friends said, well, but we will pay them so they will write whatever we say that they have to, they have to write. And Manuel Musso said, no, it doesn't work like this. You have to really understand it and you have to believe in it to, to, to write in a way that, that uh, really touch people. So we have to do something different. So the idea of creating a university arose uh, at that point. So uh, Musso started thinking about creating a university as a way to disseminate the ideas of, of freedom. And uh, what kind of university would a group of friends of Learner Reed uh, produce? So how can you produce the, the I mean, the, the, the typical kind of university? Well, no way. They had to think about a different kind of university. And that kind of university was a university where obviously uh, freedom and responsibility was at the heart of it, where the mission was to teach and disseminate the ethical, uh, legal and economic principles of a society of free and responsible individuals, where every student would have to discuss those ideas. They don't have to. They don't have to repeat it forever, but at least they have to discuss them. And, and if they become socialists, they will become uh, very, uh, um, very wise socialists. <laughs> it, it would be a university, uh, if it is related with the ideas of fee, a university that would not accept uh, public subsidies. Of course. It would be a university <laughs> that would not accept tenure and, um, and believe me, this happens at UFM. Even, even the president doesn't have any tenure. So imagine the incentive that this means. If my speech tonight is bad, the board, part of the board is here on Monday, they kick me out of the university. <laughs> so this is a great incentive. And it would be a university where you would have to, uh, as a non-profit organization, you would have to allocate resources, but you don't have the price mechanism, uh, supposedly. So you would have to be different from other universities, and uh, you would have to solve the allocation problem in a way that is, uh, that is consistent with your ideas, right? So. Uh, this is the way they thought about creating a market of resources at UFM so that the one who gets the best room is not the friend of the president 
or the, or the friend of the secretary, but the person or the group or the program that really is creating more value. Uh, this is, uh, many universities, when they come to UFM, uh, ask many, many deans and, 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 and presidents of other universities, what, you have a market here? Every, every department has to buy or to rent the rooms and rent the, the, the equipment? We say, yes, we believe in free markets, we believe in market. And uh, obviously it will be uh, an organization that is, uh, we were talking yesterday and, and this morning about uh, customer-oriented uh, organization uh, that fee is. Uh, and, and of course it will be a, a university that is uh, client or customer-oriented. Uh, it would be also a, a place, uh, a learning place, where the professor would not be the center of, of the classroom, but it would be uh, instead the student, uh, each individual, each different individual, the center of the, of the classroom. And obviously, after all what we have heard today from FEE about technology, it would be a university that is uh, friendly to accept all kind of new technologies. So this is basically what UFM is about. Uh, you take all these ingredients that you have heard uh, today here, and, and this was the inspiration that uh, Manuela Yao uh, and, and all the team uh, later have, have been developing in Guatemala. Obviously, we didn't start with that campus. This is the campus today. <laughs> it started uh, in, in a much smaller campus, uh, a very, very humble <laughs> place. Uh, with a tent in order to be able to give classes <laughs> when, when you had several group, groups at the same time, not everybody could be inside the building, so they had the classes outside. And uh, this was uh, in, the, uh, in the early 70s. In, in 1971, the UFM was, was uh, let's say, uh, officially accepted or accredited. And it began, uh, it began to, uh, at the end of this year, the beginning of the next year, it began uh, classes, courses. So it was a few months, a couple of months after ben Benjamin Rogge said that we will see in the coming decades the results of what FI is doing uh, that, uh, that uh, Uni Universidad Francisco Marroquín started. Uh, this is Manuela Yao in the, in the, um, um, in the first uh, lecture uh, when the university was inaugurated. And this is one of the very first honorary degrees that was given. Here you see Leonard Reed and Henry Haslitt that received both uh, in the mid-70s the honorary degree by UFM. Uh, here's Leonard again. Bettina also received an honorary degree from, from UFM. And here's uh, Hans Senholz uh, receiving also an honorary degree. There you see Olga uh, and you see Manuel with, with Hans. So, most of you, who, who has been at UFM here? Well, almost, well, well, no, no, you don't count. The UFM gang doesn't count. Okay, less, less than half of the, of, the, of the room, maybe 30, 40 percent of the room. Some of you might, might not know UFM campus, but might know uh, the new media. As, as Gonzalo was mentioning, new media of UFM was one of the first new medias in the world. In, in, the, year, in the late 90s, new media started. In the year 1998, we have Wi-Fi, and in the year 2001, we, we start having video streaming, long before uh, other institutions had video streaming. So we have thousands and thousands and thousands of videos today that uh, people, from, especially from the Spanish-speaking world, but also uh, from the uh, Anglo-Saxon or English-speaking world can, can, um, can follow. Um, we, have other, we have been developing for years uh, many other projects. So the Henry Hazlitt Archive is one, a very dear uh, project to us. It's a project that we did together with FEE, and it was sponsored, and th thanks to the support of, of Liberty Fund, was possible, and, and it's, a, it's a fantastic uh, resource. We have heard uh, in the last couple of years of researchers that have been using this for, uh, uh, for doctoral thesis, and, and the letters I show you, some of the letters I show you come from, from this archive. The, the Hayek interviews, uh, this, this is funny. One day, Giancarlo Ibarguen and, uh, met uh, Jerry Jordan. You all know Jerry, I guess. And um, Giancarlo told Jerry, uh, they were talking about Hayek and say yes, yes, but Hayek thought that specifically regarding this. What? No, no. How do you know this? 
said Jerry. And Giancarlo, oh, because I've read it. No, no, no way. You, it's not possible. Yes, I've read it. Where? In the internet. What? Yes, in the internet. Here, here's my laptop. Here it is. Oh, that's not possible. What's the matter? Asked Giancarlo. I said, I'm the owner of the copyright of all these interviews. <laughs> so since, since the, um, these, these were Hayek's interviews, uh, and, and since uh, the price went down to zero at that moment for, uh, for Jerry, Giancarlo asked him to, to start a, a project that was the, the Hayek interviews. And today you can, you can follow all these interviews with the, our rich media platform where you can research, writing whatever uh, keywords you want, and you go text and, and voice and image are synchronized so you can do research in the videos. Uh, we have developed the, the Kirchner Entrepreneurial Center, uh, the, the, um, the Euristica. Euristica is, is, a, is a boot camp, an incubator of, uh, of businesses that is specially designed for people in US, UFM, but, but it's also open to, to people from outside. We have been um, um, uh, fostering uh, entrepreneurship and new, new ide business ideas thanks to this, uh, this uh, incubator that was designed by Giancarlo. Uh, the Bernard Smith uh, Experimental uh, uh, Center um, is also at, at, at Francisco Marroquin University and uh, Vernon has been uh, very kind to, to donate his uh, software, et cetera. Another problem you may have heard about is the, is the Antigua Forum. In fact, uh, I think Gonzalo and, and some other people mentioned it today. The Antigua Forum is a place of learning for reformers. And um, it's a place where we put together, uh, well, first of all, it's a place, it, it, it's, it's an event, well, it's an unconference, right? Uh, it's an unconference where we put together reformers, political reformers, classical liberal political reformers, and entrepreneurs that see reforms in a very different way. We open stations and people in spontaneous order go to those projects that they want to, where they want to put their energy, and we create this tension between, between reformers and, 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 uh, and disruptors, and a uh, lot of project, uh, specific project, uh, uh, are developed, implementation projects uh, on reforms are, are developed. Um, we collaborate with, with also with other organizations. This is a collaboration with Instituto Juan de Mariana about uh, the scholastic tradition to show uh, and to research about the, the, the scholastic origin of some of the, the free market ideas um, that we uh, defend today. Uh, the Center for Capitalism is a center uh, especially for uh, objectivist and Ayn Rand ideas, not only, but mainly for objectivist and, and, and Ayn Rand ideas. Uh, we have there the, the Atlas Libertas sculpture. Those of you who has been there know how big the sculpture is. And, um, and the university has also two museums, two, two fantastic museums uh, and an organization for the arts. We also have an arboretum where we try to develop uh, or we try to show that you can defend uh, and envir uh, the environment through private means, exclusively through private means. So we have been, we have been taking care uh, of, of the, of the um, environment around the university. And uh, a finance research center that we created this year, and a conscious business center, so conscious capitalism, uh, Startup Cities Institute, where we try to help everyone who, wherever they are around the world, they try to start a free city or competitive governance, competitive uh, governments. Uh, we try to help them from, from, from there. We collaborate with other universities. This year we are having the uh, uh, MIT Global Startup Workshop in March 25th, 27th. You are all invited. The treasurer is not here. Ramon didn't come, so you are all invited to, to, the, <laughs> to, the, to, the, to the event. And so you see that the, that, uh, the university is a, is a, is a place where uh, it, it was designed, uh, or it was thought, uh, inspired in, in fees ideas, and mainly uh, as, as, as an Austrian uh, school of economic university, but it's, uh, it has become a house for all uh, classical liberal schools. In fact, this is one of the things that our Chicago friends tell us every time they come, they say, Oh my God! I I I I feel so at home and so at ease when I when I when I'm at uh, UFM because there is such a nice discussion between, between among all schools, 
public choice schools, and, and they are all represented and very well represented. So it's an ecumenical uh, campus, in fact. Uh, and I forgot to mention, it's also a university. We also have classes and uh, these kind of things. <laughs> Uh, usually classes are not like this, uh, are more like these kind of Socratic uh, classrooms. And we teach from, from architecture, well, obviously economics and law, and architecture, medicine. Uh, uh, Kayu will kill me because this is the old odontolo uh, dentistry school. On Monday we are inaugurating the new building. <laughs> I should have taken a picture from the new building, yes. And, um, uh, but regardless of what you study, you can study economics, uh, law, uh, architecture, as I said, medicine, but you have to study uh, the principles of a free uh, and responsible um, society. And for that, the university created the uh, Henry Hazlitt Center. The Henry Hazlitt Center is, the, is basically the core of the university. It's the place where all the ethic courses, economic courses, and, 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 and legal courses uh, on liberty are designed and are uh, taught to, to the students from the different faculties. And, um, and, and all the students are, are especially um, uh, familiar with the ideas of, 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 of Henry Hazlitt. We, we also uh, have, uh, since, since we believe in competition, we have different, for example, master programs. And we have master programs that compete with each other. And some people say, well, what, are you crazy? You're, you're getting the customers from one program to the other. But uh, this was a way that uh, um, the board designed in order to, 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 to increase quality. If you have competition, quality goes up. So uh, we have several, a uh, couple of masters that do exactly, well, something very similar in a different way, but, but uh, they give MBAs. So they have to compete with each other. Also the Michael Polanyi College, in a way, methodologically, competes with other faculties. So the faculties have to raise their quality. And uh, right now we, we, are, we are developing several uh, uh, new programs. Uh, and in order to develop these programs, we have, uh, it has become a tradition now, a very expensive tradition, but a tradition nonetheless, to bring some people from all around the world and discuss for a couple of days uh, uh, how would a great program like that be in reality. And, and uh, using the Antigua Forum format, we have been developing uh, several programs. Th some of those programs you will hear about probably in the next uh, year, or couple of years, uh, are, for example, the, the business cycle, the business cycle observatory. So it's an Austrian business cycle center, but uh, trying to be very focused, very specific, very, very applied. Uh, the uh, um, massive online open course on El Quixote, both in Spanish and English. So that we will try to get the message and the ideas of liberty through El Quixote, especially this year. This is the 400th anniversary of, of, of the work. And a K-12 uh, um, a K-12 platform uh, where we are going to, to try to be an alternative to the public education at very low cost online, online K-12 education. So these, these are some of the, the projects. Well, we, we we have been able to, to, to develop these things because some people believe in the power of ideas, especially if those ideas are delivered uh, in a way that is meaningful to people. Because, uh, because some people uh, invested in uh, the next generation of freedom and because some people cared about, prosper uh, about posterity. Uh, so the fact that uh, that some people cared about posterity, the fact that some people invested in the next generation some years ago, and especially the fact that uh, the Freeman was there, that a copy of the Freeman was there and was given to one of Manuela Yao's friends, make a huge difference in Guatemala and in Central America. So thank you, Fee, and thank you all. Thank you, Gabriel. I know it's accurate to say that uh, FEE has partnerships with many organizations around the world, but the deepest 
the longest and the strongest partnership that we have is with Universidad Francisco Marroquin. It goes back further, it's more deep, it's uh, renewed every year with the uh, presence of 10, 20 or more UFM students at FEE seminars, which we deeply appreciate. And whenever I'm asked, and others at FEE as well are asked, uh, what are the better universities in the world to go to? You're always on our list. And we always add a little addendum when it comes to liberty. No university does it better than Universidad Francisco Marroquin. <laughs> now a few closing uh, remarks to send us off. Uh, the year is 1320. For more than a quarter century, the Scots and the British, or the English, have been at war with each other. If you saw the movie Braveheart, you'll recall that much, some of that period is chronicled in that movie, and it ends with the execution of one of Scotland's great freedom fighters, William Wallace, in 1305. The movie uh, ends in that year. It does not go on to tell you what happened in the following 15, a very remarkable 15-year period, during which time the Scots rallied under the leadership of Robert the Bruce, and by 1320, they had effectively expelled the English uh, from Scotland. They were worried that the English may return and deprive them of their independence and their liberties. They fashioned a document known in history to this day, known very well by America's founders, though not uh, nearly as well known today, sadly, a document called the Declaration of Arbroath. Issued in 1320, it was aimed at the Pope. It was the hope of the Scots that the Pope would lean on the English and tell them stay out of Scotland. But it did so much more than just ask the Pope to do that. It made some pretty profound observations about the nature of human beings and the importance of liberty. In that document issued 456 years before the, dec the Declaration of Independence, the Scots asserted for the first time in human history that it was the duty of the sovereign to rule by the consent of the governed and the duty of the governed to get rid of him if he didn't. And it went on to explain to the world why the Scots had been fighting. And one of the concluding lines is one of my favorites uh, of all time from all of history. It's the message I want to send off to you tonight that, and that I hope will inspire you even more than this conference has uh, so far. The line read as follows, it is not for honors or glory or wealth that we fight, but for freedom alone, which no good man gives up except with his life. 1320. All of you know the message well. Some of you have come to know it because of your association with FEE, and we're particularly proud of that. But I implore all of you to leave this evening as renewed missionaries for liberty, looking for every opportunity to spread the good word, to pass on a piece of literature from FEE or another free market, freedom-oriented organization. Don't just be content with the important task of learning more yourself, but look for opportunities to teach others as well, to open minds, young and old, uh, to ideas of liberty. It is one of, if not the, most earthly, or noble, earthly causes that one can commit himself to. With that message in mind, I uh, uh, send all you missionaries off to do good work on behalf of liberty. We hope we'll see all of you and more next time, next year, at this time, and thanks again for making this uh, event such an important success to us. Thank you so much. Thank you.